David Gorski is going to be our first person doing our Why We Fight Part 1. Why We Fight Part 1, Stanislaw Brzezinski versus science-based medicine. David Gorski is an uh, academic surgeon at Wayne State University School of Medicine. Here's your haiku. Why We Fight is clear. Here's Part 1 to tell you why. Stay tuned for Part 2. Please welcome David Gorski. Hello. All right, the, t the title is Why We Fight, and I hope the reason will become obvious as we go on. Now, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm the uh, managing editor of the Science-Based Medicine blog with Steve Novella, Harriet Hall, and the rest of the crew. Um, thank you. So, let's get started. I'm, we're going to start, we decided to do this in two parts, and I'm going to do the medicine and science mainly. Uh, not exclusively, but mainly, and Bob will do the, uh, the patients. Now, this is, this is a man named Stanislaw Brzezinski. Um, the theme of this year's uh, TAM is fighting the fakers. Now, some fakers are easy to tell, homeopaths, uh, Hulda Clark, I don't know how many of you know who Hulda Clark was, uh, but some are not quite as obvious, and in fact, this is a guy who sometimes fools even, you know, physicians. And he kind of skirts the edges of science-based medicine versus, you know, pseudoscience. So I thought we would talk about him and he could be a lead into the panel. So some of you may have seen this movie or seen of, heard of it. Some of you may have gone to screenings of the sequel to this movie, which just came out a month and a half ago. It's a movie called... Well, Brzezinski the movie, great, great, uh, you know, great originality there. And the sequel is appropriately enough called Part Two. Um, the first part basically paints Brzezinski as this brave maverick cancer doctor who's curing cancer patients, but the man, as in the government, FDA, Texas Medical Board, Big Pharma, um, our reptilian overlords are um, <laughs> keeping him down. Part two is more of the same, with one exception. There is a long segment about the skeptics. And, and, it's, and it really is in scare quotes and capitalized if you look in the movie. I'm not kidding. In fact, it's on uh, Mercola.com for free. And if you really want to see a bit of propaganda and see sort of why we fight and why this can even be convincing to skeptics sometimes, take a look. But in any case, um, not, they've also, the, the man who made this film, Eric Marola, has also been known to attack skeptics online. So for instance, you can see that I've been called a white supremacist. But that's not bad enough. I also apparently like to eat puppies. <laughs> now he took these tweets down in all fairness because I think they embarrassed even him, but there's plenty more where that came from that are almost as bad. I must confess, though, I haven't quite reached Steve's level of awesomeness, and I can't resist this slide, because about three or four years ago, Steve Novella, and you'll see Steve Novella, Paul Offit, and Trini Sedaris, who is a, a journalist, being portrayed at a nice Thanksgiving feast. Now, for those of you in the back, you probably can't see what is the Thanksgiving feast. It's a baby. So Steve's been portrayed as a baby-eating cannibal. I really need to up my game. But let's get to Brzezinski. He's been promoted in books. There's a whole chapter about him on uh, Suzanne Summers' book. Um, his lawyer, Richard Jaffe, wrote a book. About a half of it is about Brzezinski. And a uh, columnist named Thomas Elias wrote a book called The Brzezinski Breakthrough, which basically is more of the same. I do like this part, though. Yes, if you, ca you can't read, you may not be able to read it, but it basically says, includes clinical trial data. I always thought that a medical journal was a place for clinical trial data. Um, but that's just me. Let's go way back. This is a long time, and this is, hard, this is really hard to synthesize in just 20 minutes. Um, back to his Baylor years. In 19 he arrived in the United States from Poland, where he had been born during World War II, <clears throat> and he went to medical school in Poland. And, and in 1970, he decided to come to the US because, according to him, he would have either had to join the army or do whatever the Communist Party told him to do. Um, 
So he says he arrives with 20 bucks in his pocket. I have no reason to disbelieve that. But his, um, you know, his, his pro he showed up and he got a job at Baylor. And he actually was, a, during these years, it wasn't bad. He was actually a reasonable scientist. He published, he even got an NIH grant. Um, but then later in that tenure, something seemed to happen. Um, but first, let's talk about his discovery. He called it anti-neoplastons. The idea was to him, and he's, he said he, he first made this observation in Poland as part of his thesis project, that there are substances in the blood, amino acids and peptides, that are at higher levels in normal people than patients with cancer, and he thought that a deficiency in these somehow had something to do with the development of cancer. Not unreasonable. Um, might have even been right. Um, but it's, the problem is what he ended up doing with it. So he, he basically fractionated urine and blood, and he, he originally found 39 fractions, and it ballooned. The more he fractionated, the more he found these things that seemed to have anti-cancer activity. But the two that you need to know about is AS2.1, which is a chemical called phenylacetic acid, which is a byproduct of metabolism that's turned into phenylacetylglutamine by the liver. And soluble A10 is basically the same thing. It breaks down to PAG. And these are substances that were actually studied in the 50s and 60s and not found to be particularly um, promising. But that, he didn't know that then. Um, now here's where things start to go off the rails. <clears throat> Back in 76 or so, he thought he was ready to test antineoplastons in humans. Great, right? I mean, part of the problem, though, is, so he went to a Baylor's IRB, for those of you who don't know, and IRB is an institutional review board. It's the ethics panel that, you know, looks at human research to make sure that the patients are protected. And according to Elias and Jaffe, he, didn't, he was rejected because he didn't have an IND. An IND is just basically an investigational new drug application, and the FDA requires that before you can do a clinical trial. That shouldn't be too big of a deal just to apply for that. I mean, there are a lot of things going on at this time. He didn't want to share with Baylor. And, you know, when you work for a university and you discover something, usually the university takes the rights and you just get a cut. But I also, reading between the lines, I tend to think there was probably also a lack of preclinical evidence. There was an astounding a a lack of animal work, which he dismissed as by saying that antineoplastons were species-specific. Um, there are ways of getting around that. Um, and think about it. He didn't know what they were then. They were fractions from urine. You probably should purify them more and figure out what, what's in them before you start giving them to humans. So he actually went out on his own. Now, he had actually started treating patients, according to both Elias and Jaffe, before he left Baylor. And Baylor didn't like that for reasons that should be obvious. He treated patients in a private clinic. So he left Baylor. Um, he also lost his NIH grant around this time, too. And he started out in a relatively small storefront. But, I'm sorry, office. But he, it was not very long before he had built up this really amazing institute and clinic. I mean, this, this, this you know, the, the clinic in the lower left-hand corner is his clinic. And those other pictures are pictures of his manufacturing facility where he now synthesizes anti-neoplastons. It's actually pretty amazing. Now, um, around this time he started to get some publicity. And one place where he got national publicity for a very, perhaps the first time, was that fine medical journal Penthouse. <laughs> by an, art an article by a guy by the name of Gary Null. How many people know who Gary Null is? He's you know, he, he's very big in the alternative industry, and I think he was just a, a, young, a young quack starting out, in my opinion. Um, and it was an article called The Suppression of Cancer Cures, and Stanislaw Brzezinski was portrayed as the brave maverick doctor who was curing cancer, even though the man was keeping him down, and Baylor kicked him out. Remember, this was just two years after he left Baylor. So, and, and around this time, he became known as the urine doctor, for some obvious reasons. Um, it took liters of urine, liters upon liters upon liters of urine to make this stuff. And 
early on before he used to get them from blood and in fact he was kind of not the greatest party guest in the world because he'd show up with blood drawing equipment and try to get people to let him draw their blood so that he could isolate antineoplastons. He didn't get invited to too many parties pretty quickly um, and people started to kind of avoid him. Um, but he then went to prisons, public parks, and one of my favorite sources of all, Gilly's Bar. Now, this was at the height of the urban cowboy craze, and um, one has to wonder if perhaps John Travolta contributed his own little small way to, you know, to anti-neoplaston research. Now, ethics, the big problem here was research ethics from the very beginning. And it continued. He's been visited by the FBA, visited. He's been investigated by the F FDA a couple of times uh, in the last 13 years. And there are a bunch of problems. And I'm, I'm not going to go through all of these, but some of them, not reporting adverse events. That's a real no-no in clinical research. Failure to follow proper informed consent procedures. Research approved without determining whether the risk to subject was minimized. And one thing I can't figure out how he gets away with is an old buddy of his um, from Baylor is the, is the chair of his IRB. He's also the chair of the, he's the chairman of the board of directors of the Brzezinski Research Institute. Imagine if a pharmaceutical company did that. Okay. Over the next 15 years, the story continued. Um, battle after battle with various regulatory agencies, including the Texas Medical Board. The National Cancer Institute isn't a regulatory agency, but it tried to work with him in the 90s to see if there was anything to this stuff. And it never quite worked out. I think a lot of it was Brzezinski's ego. A lot of it was also that every time they tried to bring you know, safety and they wanted to lower the dose to make sure it was a safe dose, that Brzezinski would resist. And it, you know, basically things broke down. <clears throat> the FDA, of course, Aetna and other insurance companies, patients were trying to get these paid for by insurance, so this caused a problem. And in late 1995, he was indicted by a federal grand jury for insurance fraud, um, uh, transport, you know, shipping unapproved drugs over state lines, administering unapproved drugs, um, and a variety of other charges. The trial was in 1997, early 1997. He beat the rap, okay? He, it was a hung jury. And some of the reason may have been at least his powerful allies. Remember Joe Barton? We just heard about Joe Barton. Before he became a climate denier, he was helping Brzezinski. And he, in 1996, he held hearings where he brought patients for, of Brzezinski to tell their stories in front of Congress. And they, you know, remember, these patients honestly believed that Brzezinski was their only hope to live or the only hope for their family member. So it was like they were crying. They were like, they were afraid they were going to die because they were going to shut down Brzezinski. It was very effective political theater. Dan Burton, who is fortunately no longer in Congress, and of course, the patients. They were probably his most effective tool. Oh, he, he had one other. I don't know if you can call him an ally, but I love this picture, so I'm just going to show it for a second. He met the Pope. Uh, the, uh, there, was, there were rumors that he was treating the Pope, but they, they turn out not to be true. So what about all these clinical trials? Right now, if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, there are 61 clinical trials under Brzezinski's name. If you, you can't read it, but most of those, if you see them, they show either closed or unknown status, but you say, okay, he had 61 clinical trials. This must be science, right? <laughs> oh, they wouldn't let him do this otherwise, would they? I'm not so sure. The reason these clinical trials exist, it turns out, <clears throat> is a 1998 consent agreement between the Texas Attorney General and Brzezinski that tells him he could not distribute unapproved drugs in Texas he can only use antineoplastons if it's part of an FDA-approved clinical trial, unless the FDA approves it, obviously. And he can't advertise them for the treatment of cancer. It, it, you know, it goes on. There were some other conditions. But that's the gist of it. 
So uh, before this, though, they had been very smart. Uh, let, you know, you listen to Brzezinski's lawyer, and, and I swear I don't understand like why Brzezinski would let, him, let his lawyer say stuff this damning in his own book, but he does. So get a load of some of these quotes. Referring to one of the clinical trials, he said, it was a joke. There could not be any possibility of meaningful data coming out of the so-called clinical trial. It was all an artifice that, you know, designed so that they could keep giving the treatment. The FDA wanted all of his patients to be on an IND, so that's what we did. And there was some, and they went beyond this. It, realizing this, that a cancer clinic cannot survive on existing patients, it needs a constant flow of new patients. Again, imagine if like, I said that about my cancer institute. Um, they'd be all over me. But in any case, Brzezinski personally put together 72 protocols to treat every type of cancer the clinic had treated, everything Brzezinski wanted to treat in the future. All of Brzezinski's patients are now on FDA-approved clinical trials. He could treat anyone he wanted to treat. Oh and charge tens of thousands of dollars to hundreds of thousands of dollars to do it. So let's look at the clinical trial record. So it's of these 61 clinical trials, <coughs> excuse me, how many of them, how many completed trials have been published? You know, completed trials in the peer-reviewed literature? Zero. You know, now here, here's, Here's what he does have, though, and he has a lot of these. He has testimonials, and I've done whole talks on evaluating cancer testimonials, but if you boil it down to the main points, there are a couple of rules. Dead patients don't give testimonials. You can't argue with that. There are always outliers who do better than expected, and sometimes, rarely, but not impossible, there are spontaneous remissions. Now, you, ask, you have to ask some questions about these testimonials. Was the cancer there? This is not always easy to tell when you look at the testimonials. It, it, it really isn't. You might think this is a really basic question, but it's not always easy to answer. Did it go away? This is also not always easy to answer. Was the treatment the only one used? Sometimes these cancers actually do get better or go away because of the conventional therapy that was given and then the alternative therapy came later. Um, again, I could go through a whole bunch of patients, but we just don't have time, so I picked one. <clears throat> this is, a, patient, this is a, a teenager by the name of Tori Marino. She was born in 1998. And she was diagnosed with a, an inoperable brainstem glioma within weeks of being born. And this is her on high-dose steroids, so that's why she, the, the, she looks, looks um, that way. And the bottom is her page, her page on the Brzezinski patient group page, where, where she is now, you know, 50, uh, apparently healthy 15-year-old. So she was treated by Brzezinski, and she seems to have gotten better. So what happened? Well, you have to look at two possibilities. One possibility is the story is as advertised. You can't deny that's possible. Or, another possibility, it turns out she never got a biopsy. Now, this is not an unreasonable approach, and most, a lot of brain tumors don't get biopsied because brain biopsies are invasive, dangerous procedures, and if they're not going to make a difference in the treatment, there's no reason to do it. Here's the problem. Occa there are occasional false positives, things that show up on MRI that look for all the world like a glioma and turn out to be something different, inflammatory masses, various other things. It's not real common, maybe 5% tops, but it happens. And what about antineoplastines? Here's, they're advertised as being a natural, non-toxic treatment. Well, not so much. They're very sodium rich, and the freak, a frequent complication is hypernatremia. And in fact, the Texas Children's Hospital, which is not too far from the Brzezinski Clinic, the, the director of the ICU there, the pediatric ICU, is, is quite familiar with Brzezinski patients showing up with hypernatremia, life-threatening sometimes. Other lesser ones, there's rashes. Now, th th these are photos that I took, that, I, that screen captures of uh, Hannah Bradley, whose partner filmed her 
journey. She's a young woman with a, uh, with a brain tumor who went to Brzezinski Clinic. She had all sorts of miserable complications. And there have been occasional deaths. And in fact, right now, the Brzezinski Clinic is, has a temporary clinical hold placed on antineoplastons. It cannot enroll new patients on antineoplastons, although it can keep treating the ones that already are there. So what you got to remember, and, and this is a picture to kind of demonstrate that, is that antineoplastons are chemotherapy. If they work, they're chemotherapy. If they don't work, they're ineffective chemotherapy. Last thing. <clears throat> Lately, over the last five years or so, Brzezinski has, has, has gotten into what he calls personalized gene-targeted therapy. Um, this, I, I you know, the, and, and here's the, how it's sold, and this is Eric Marola again, he's saying, don't tell MD Anderson that they're, they are following his, Brzezinski's, lead. And the link here is to the, Brzez, is to the MD Anderson personalized gene, tar, you know, personalized cancer therapy page. As if MD, he thought of the idea and MD Anderson is following his lead. And you see this time and time again on Brzezinski sites. This is not what he, this is what he does. He uses a commercial gene test from Keras uh, technology that anyone can order. There's nothing unique about it. it. They do various tests. They do some next generation sequencing. They produce a list of genes that are overexpressed. And they suggest targeted therapies. He makes up a bunch of tar he, he picks a bunch of targeted therapies, gives them to the patient without regard for whether there's synergistic toxicity, and boom, there you go. I call it gene targeted therapy for dummies because it's really not anything unique or anything innovative. So let's finish with a question before Bob comes out: Quack or not? It's th he's had 36 years to prove that his, ther his treatment works. Is he a quack? It's, it's, it's not, it, it's, it's, it's difficult. I'm, and we can talk about that a little on the panel. In the meantime, I will thank you, ask you to go to Science Based Medicine, and follow us on Twitter, and let Bob come out and finish the story. Dave Gorski, David Gorski. Part one is done.